Hi, welcome everyone. And thank you so much for joining us tonight at International Print Center New York for this conversation with artist Karen J. Rivas, Electra KB, independent curator David Platzker, and Assembly Room. I'm Jen Bradovich. I'm IPCNY's exhibition and curatorial manager. I'm a white woman with brown hair uh, with a bun and bangs, and I'm wearing a black shirt and a blazer and tortoiseshell glasses. After six long months, we are very happy that IPCNY is reopening our Chelsea New York space tomorrow with Living in America, an exhibition in four acts curated by Assembly Room. I'm in the gallery now. I'm in front of a brand new work by Electric KB that you'll hear about tonight. Living in America is a group exhibition about the transformative and imaginative power of art in times of political and social crisis and is organized in four thematic acts, just like a play. You can see Act One, Outrage, and Act Two, Love, beginning tomorrow. There will be an intermission in November, after which we'll open the second half of the show, which Act Three, Hope, and Act Four, Care. We're asking the public to book reservations to see the show in advance. So you can do that at ipcny.org slash visit. Living in America is also being presented in an online format with a few additional works and texts. The first two acts of the show launch today, so you can get a sneak peek tonight. If you go to ipcny.org slash living in America, there's a button to send you straight to the exhibition portal. So tonight, this is the first in a series of online public programs that we're holding in conjunction with Living in America, all hosted on Zoom. It's a series of conversations with artists from the show moderated by our curator's assembly room. There's live captioning and they'll all be recorded and posted online afterwards, so watch for that. The Q&A box will be available to you throughout the program. Uh, so don't be shy, ask questions. This is a conversation. We'll do our best to end on time at 8 p.m. Thank you for spending your hour with us wherever you are tonight. So in the spirit of the themes of Living in America and of tonight's talk, before we get started, I just wanna welcome everyone um, in the panel tonight to join me on screen. And we're just gonna hold um, a moment of silence for folks who have suffered and who continue to suffer from political oppression and who are engaged in the fight for a more just future. Thanks everyone. I'm very happy to welcome our Living in America curators tonight, Natasha Becker, Paola Gallio, and Yulia Topchi, the founders of Assembly Room. Assembly Room is a curatorial collective founded in 2018 to empower women identifying curators living and working in New York City and beyond, and to contribute to a more global and diverse art ecosystem. With that, I turn it over to Assembly Room and those joining the conversation tonight in conjunction with Living in America's First Act Outrage. Thank you, Jen. Um, I'm Natasha Becker, and I am a brown-skinned woman with short grayish black hair, and I'm wearing a black uh, sweater this evening. And I am greeting you from New York City. Um, we are excited to welcome you here tonight and to launch the exhibition online and in physical space with this first conversation. Um, and to welcome also our artists, uh, Karen J. Rivas and Electra KB, um, who will uh, join uh, the conversation with uh, our respondent, our very special guest, David Platzke, who is also a curator and a specialist of prints. Um, we would like to thank Assembly, uh, Assembly Room would like to thank Judy Hecker, um, the excellent and warm director of IPCNY, as well as her amazing team for uh, inviting us to curate the show and to work with them 
on the full program. So thank you, IPCNY. Um, before I say a few things about what tonight's talk will be about, I would like to introduce my co-curators in the exhibition, um, Yulia Topchi and Paola Gallio. Yulia, would you like to go first? Sure, thank you, Natasha, for introducing me. And um, I would like to thank IPCNY, uh, Judy, Jan, Emma, and Marina for this incredible opportunity and generous collaboration. Thank you for uh, all the guest speakers tonight. Um, and also my gratitude extends to all 13 artists involved in making this exhibition happen. And it's been a tremendous journey for us, especially discovering the artists that none of us have worked with in the past. And we discovered many talents, we were moved, we were inspired, and we are happy to share this all with you starting tonight online and tomorrow in person. Um, additionally, I would like to highlight that new work is shown here in the exhibition space for the first time by Electric TV, who is going to speak tonight. Uh, Yeshua Klaas, Azikwi Mohammed, Afrikanas, and Afrikaner Sakonan, who will be presented after November 11th um, in the exhibition space, um, also following by the site-specific stem cell installation by Nancy Kaledo Mutiti. So with that uh, in mind, I welcome you to explore, to ask questions and uh, to be inspired um, and to connect with artists who are um, channeling our outreach, inspire us to love, uh, live in hope and act with care. Thank you. And hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm Paola Gallio. I'm the third member of Assembly Room and co-founder of Assembly Room. I'm an independent curator. I'm Italian immigrant. And uh, tonight, you can see me with these um, um, DJ um, headphone on. Um, I want to thank everybody to be here again, David, Electra, Karen, and the staff of the International Print Center of New York. Um, it's been a great journey, and this is the first of a series of conversation that would be um, programmed for the duration of the whole show, and it will be one of uh, for each act. The next one is going to be Tuesday, October. 20th, same hour, same place, Zoom. And um, it will be with the artist Mildred Beltre, Azik Mohammed, and Adarish uh, Walker. So save the date, and I will see you there again. And now we can start the conversation. Thank you. I'm going to say a few brief words about the show and then um, the outline of tonight's program. Um, living in America, we were inspired by music, by James Brown. We were inspired by theater, Augusto Bowles, Theater of the Press. We were inspired by literature and the work of James Baldwin. Um, and the 13 artists in the exhibition um, that unfolds over this full, full season in these four acts. We were also thinking about each act in this play as foregrounding the importance of our emotions um, on our actions and how our emotions can be a powerful motivating force for um, positive action. And so looking at how artists have um, and, and all of us actually have gone through this range of emotions on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. Um, and, and turning that into um, positive actions in the world, um, in the social world, as well as in the cultural world. So tonight's talk, um, we invited two of the artists in the first two acts, Karen Rivas and Electra B. And they are joined with our special guest speaker, David Plasker, who is also a curator and a specialist in prints and especially uh, the relationship between prints and protest, which this first um, installment and first act kicks off with this uh, focus on outrage and on protest. And um, so 
we'll be talking tonight about artistic practices like electors, like Karen's, that include storytelling, critique, and protest in print media, inspired by print media, um, but also in, you know, in response to the Black Lives Matter protests and in response to the inequalities that the COVID pandemic in New York City and in the United States, the inequalities that the pandemic has re revealed and laid bare um, that were always there, inequalities in um, healthcare, inequalities in neighborhoods and you know, spatial segregations. Um, so we, we feel really um, excited and also uh, you know, inspired by their work and their activism. And um, what we will do is to have uh, Karen and Electra present us with a slideshow of their works in the show, as well as additional works. Um, and then David Plasco will follow as a respondent to the artist. Um, and kick off a conversation between the three of them that we hope everyone will join in. So please, if there are any questions that occur to you along the way, put it in the chat box. If you have any questions for the curators or the artists or, you know, an issue that comes up in the conversation, please feel free to uh, drop your question in the chat, back, chat, chat box when you think about it so that we can um, raise those later. So without further ado, I'm going to kick off uh, the discussion with Karen Rivas. Um, please introduce yourself, Karen, and get the ball rolling. Okay. Um, so, yes, I am Karen Rivas. I am a black woman, um, short brown hair, glasses, uh, sitting in my studio with a linoleum cut of roses um, behind me. Um, I'm from DC. I've been in New York about 25-ish yeah, years. Um, I moved here to go to Pratt and um, I have been making art ever since. So I just want to share my screen here. Okay, can everybody see? Thumbs up? All right. Okay, so um, Karen J. Revis is me, and the work that's in the show is from um, a line of work that I call Revisionary Prints. And I call it Revisionary Prints, one, because my last name is Revis, and that's part of the title. And also a lot of the work that I do um, originates from images that I find in the media and then I revised them to make them my own. So I just wanted to, to show a little bit of the work um, that I do. So I do two different types of work. I do the Visionary Prints work, which came about about five years ago. Um, but for many years, um, I've been doing um, monoprint, uh, abstract, kind of color field um, work. And so this work I made with um, two different master printmakers, um, one Kathy Caraccio and one Sheila Marvang. And um, I love this work because I love color. I love um, monoprints. You move really fast, so you have to think quick. And I liked everything about this, this technique. And I loved working with um, a master printmaker. So that's one. And then this is another of that type of work. So about five years ago, um, I felt like this work wasn't saying everything that I wanted to say. And I had in my mind, I wanted to make work that talked about um, my experience as a black woman, my experience being raised in a black community, um, speaking to my family, my heroes. And so I started um, making work that, again, I started, I call uh, revisionary prints. 
So this is um, one of the first images um, that I made. And I kind of thought about it. I, I thought about what image could I use that really talked about um, the community that I came from, the Black community, and also a sense of pride. And the Afro pick was the first thing that came, well, not the first thing that came to mind, but uh, I thought it was a pretty strong image to use. And so I did a series of these um, Afro picks. So this one uh, is called Power Halo, and they're also paper lithos. Um, which um, you'll find a lot of my work are paper lithos. So in the show, we have this one. Then I change the backgrounds. The drawing changed a little bit here. And then um, one thing that I really like about paper litho is, um, so I was a painter first, and once I took printmaking, then I became a printmaker because I fell in love with it. But my approach to printing is extremely painterly. Um, I don't love making additions because I like the happy accidents that happen um, with every piece. So, um, as you can see, this one's kind of fuzzy and has little pieces missing. Um, and I think that that kind of adds to the charm of the piece. So this piece is also in the show. Um, this is a newer piece that I made. And um, I was in my studio working a lot when George Floyd was murdered. And I was already making work um, that spoke to, well, me thinking about protecting Black men. And a lot of my work recently, well, it started that I wanted to use the, the image of the gun that killed Trayvon Martin. This is kind of when a lot of this started for me. And um, I have, so this image pops up a lot in my work and this is one of them. So it's the same, it's the drawing of the gun that killed Trayvon Martin. Um, and then obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but to me, uh, the red overlay with the holes are bullet holes, I guess. And then the, the gun being turned upside down was kind of to disarm uh, the gun. So that's this piece. This piece, um, I have a lot of images where I abstract riots and um, scenes of protest. And I call this one small riot because the image in the middle is only about three by three. Um, and it's on handmade paper um, that I made um, with, I guess you could call this pulp painting that's at the bottom. So um, it's an assemblage or a collage in a way I thought those two pieces really worked well together. And that's a detail. And this is the last piece. Um, again, you know, I was thinking of images that would protect black men. And the first thing, or again, a thing that came to mind was a bulletproof vest. Um, I have a tiny press in my studio. And when I started to do some of these images and I wanted really large images, I had to break them down into smaller pieces and then put them back together. That composition has stayed with some of my work and it's kind of fed into what the work is saying. So this is a, a charged image, um, but in a way I want to break it apart, I guess. 
And so this is this also a paper litho. And I think that that, that is it. This is Natasha speaking again. Thank you, Karen. Um, I'm just so struck by, you know, how happy the colors are, right? That you're also using the happy green, this happy red. Um, and, and, and obviously, I think, um, my own, as you said, maybe it's not so obvious, but just this contrast between the violence with the kind of just day-to-day you know, these, these colors invoke such a kind of beautiful, you know, happy uh, feeling, you know, mm -hmm. they invoke like they so, um, so I, I think that even in how you, you know, bringing abstraction back in and using that language of abstraction mm -hmm. in these prints, um, I think that's, that's part of it, you, you know, it's not like you move from abstraction to this, more figurative work to tell these stories, but actually one can see how they've now kind of come together almost, you know, to say something about the kind of banality and ordinariness and day-to-dayness of this kind of violence, I think. Um, so thank you. Um, in lecture, I am going to call on you to um, begin your presentation and share some of your work with us in the show. I think Electra might just have stepped out for a minute. Um, so do you maybe have any responses to the comment that I just made on your prints, Karen? Um, yeah, I, uh, it's funny because some of these works start out black and white and then later um, I have this need to add color to them. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I can't separate that part of what I love um, to do is make color, com you know, interesting color combinations. Um, so I guess, you know, no matter where you go, there you are, that part of right. it, you're going to be a part of my work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, I do want to say that um, even though uh, the subject matter is sad or um, shocking. Um, I think the color sometimes adds to the, the shock of it all when, you know, seeing a, a bulletproof vest that is mm -hmm. that shocking green, so. Mm -hmm. And I think that green also invokes the sort of infrared, you know, that you see um, in a lot of um, films or, you know, this, um, this, this kind of another lens, you know, or another viewpoint, another perspective. Um, but I, I also think that what is interesting about your presentation was how, my, how, how the story of black men, you know, and the violence that is done to black men, how that is so much a part of your community and the stories you're trying to tell, you know? Mm -hmm. and I, and and there are I mean there are huge implications of that for what that means for family or community you know um, which I'm sure we'll get to uh, in the conversation um, so I think there's there's uh, there's uh, there are these layers you know that we can um, pull out from these very very simple very economical use of um, uh, um, figures and, and icons and color mm -hmm. that I think is very powerful. And also just the, you know, the, the media and the dimensions with which you're working as well, mm -hmm. that I hope we'll, we'll pick up again in the discussion. Um, but Electra is back, so uh, we will head over to you and um, maybe you could start by introducing yourself, Electra. Uh, hi, my name is Electra. Sorry, I have access needs. You know, the, the body is unpredictable. I had to run to the bathroom. Um, so um, I am sitting in my studio in Brooklyn. Uh, my background is a fantastic realm of the Cathara insurgency in a magical island where there's a checkpoint. 
uh, and you can get a stateless passport. Um, I am um, um, from Colombia. Um, my mother is from the Soviet Union. My father is Colombian. I am a mestiza. Uh, my half uh, white, half brown. I am wearing a, a black beret and a black shirt and glasses. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here uh, and so honored to be part of this exhibition. I'm gonna start sharing my screen now. Uh, so, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, okay, technology. Um, is everyone able to see my PowerPoint presentation? Yes, okay. Uh, Okay, can people give me a thumbs up if they see everything okay? Cool, excellent. <clears throat> okay, um, this is a work I made during the pandemic. Uh, I, as a disabled artist, I am quite used to being quarantined and have a very um, limited um, outside mobility. I have, I work in a home studio, but uh, especially um, the pandemic gave us all, all of us a few lessons and, and different experiences from our viewpoint. Um, I made, a, this is a screenshot from a video titled Smiles, um, and it's about my, my frustration um, with lack of, of access to healthcare and lack of access to medication and lack of access to uh, the basic things uh, chronically ill and disabled people need to survive and how that was heightened during the pandemic. Um, there, there are very normal things that, that uh, the people that are chronically ill experience. Um, you know, like thinking about um, life and death, uh, it's, it's sort of uh, uh, daily. And, and you sort of put uh, in a balance um, your quality of life and you put in, in the other side of the balance the, the suffering. And, and this is what came out. So, there's an immu immunomodulator uh, that, that I need. Unfortunately, it's very expensive and I can't afford it. Uh, and I found out that, that the FDA uh, has been, um, they have been fighting to approve it since the AIDS pandemic. Um, and, and now they are starting it for, for COVID. Um, so, I made a performance as, a, as this healing uh, nurse character from the Cathara insurgency. And it was, um, let's, let's say it, uh, let's call it a healing ritual, a healing ceremony. So I really like to use this uh, imagery uh, to, to perform uh, to perform these uh, situations that they won't lead to a catharsis, but they would lead to creative paths of making uh, life uh, more, making it easier to cope with these obstacles that, you know, capitalist society and, and violence instigates upon us. Uh, so on the, on the on one side you see the formula for the immunomodulator and and everything I was hearing was birds uh, birds chirping. They were pretty happy during the, the quarantine and it's available on as an exhibition online now at art in a time like this. And the next work is uh, my second work I did during the pandemic. 
Um, it's a it's a fabric banner, and there is a, a character, uh, the same one, the uh, healing uh, Cathara. Uh, I work with a platform of another world. Uh, this world is called the Cathara Insurgency. It's a liberated autonomous territory. Uh, in another world akin to our pre-Columbian territory uh, located inside a totalitarian regime, which is the Theocratic Republic of Gaia. Um, this uh, healing character, um, it's, uh, it's um, you know, sort of like um, represents uh, the, you know, the the spirit that goes uh, behind this fight. There is a, uh, um, the table is made with pearls and there are these like hands, um, sort of like this image that you see in, in movies where there are hands uh, in a medium table and the table starts floating. So I was thinking about uh, all the all the powers the uh, and the abuse of power, but all the powers that manipulate involuntarily our lives and our lives so much depend on that. Um, so there is um, uh, there is this uh, medication bottle, and there are these bodies falling from it, and they're just uh, resting in the ground. And why is this a protest sign? This was my uh, protest against hyperproductivity and assigning human value according to what you produce. Uh, the pandemic uh, pretty much uh, overheightened that, like never before. Um, I felt that we didn't have a proper time to for peace, uh, to think, to be human, to feel, to cry, to suffer, to laugh. There was no stopping and, and there was no end to this. It was a pure uh, acceleration of hyper production. And uh, this, um, this was a thing that for me was um, devastating um, psychologically uh, as I, I felt that, you know, I had to climb the, the Himalaya every day. It was, uh, the world suddenly started working to a pace and I couldn't keep up, keep up. So I, I rode with, um, with um, trim, counterproductive, uh, so it's about uh, this idea uh, of human value as tied to productivity. I just love her wonderful nails. So I took a picture of this detail. Um, this is uh, a banner. This is a protest banner that's on the show. It says you are not alone. Uh, you know, for years um, I've worked with political prisoner support and um, there was a, a crisis of, um, of prisoners uh, becoming severely ill and um, not receiving um, safety for corona, coronavirus and, and dying. And when we think of prisons, um, um, it's not, it's prisons in the U.S. are not just uh, for, um, they're not just like institutions uh, where, where people are, are placed for so-called uh, crimes. Their prisons are many things, ICE detention centers uh, where, you know, children and babies were getting uh, uh, contaminated um, with coronavirus. Uh, people in Rikers, um, we have a, a friend in Rikers that, um, the, you know, just thinking about their, their pain and their suffering, uh, I, I made that as a, just as a show of solidarity. Um, 
thank you, Electra. Um, your work is so rich and so layered and so complex and so graphic also. There's so many different languages that you're drawing on that made your work so interesting for the show. And, you know, to speak about the um, outrage and action that people are taking and the intersection of the pandemic with um, broader social inequality, you know? And so um, I think that um, we'll probably get into some more of that complexity during the discussion, but I just wanted to thank you for highlighting the two works, the two banners that are in the exhibition. Um, and maybe to introduce um, David Platzka, our um, respondent for this conversation. And David Platzka is an expert in printmaking and um, has, uh, this um, deep uh, research and uh, interest in historical protests and the language of protests within prints as well. And so we invited David to respond to, you know, your work and other works in the show um, from both the historical, but also from this kind of contemporary perspective and, and sort of really connecting the two. So, um, David, would you like to say hi and introduce yourself and kick off the uh, conversation? Thank you, Natasha. So I'm, I'm David Platzker. I'm a middle-aged white guy with glasses sitting in my home office. And my area of interest is primarily art of the late 50s to the mid 80s with an emphasis on pop minimal conceptual art. What informed those movements, which would be surrealism um, in the history of Dada and their uh, descendants. And um, I'm acutely interested as well in the art that came out of those movements, which is to say the contemporary movements that we're living in right now, which are sort of undefinable in terms of isms or ways that we can lump them together. Uh, I'm very interested in the way that many of the themes that were active of those 60s, 70s, 80s movements are remaining to be viable and important in the way that artists are continuing to make work today. And in thinking about those particular movements and that period of time, I've been increasingly drawn to reconsider what was transpiring within the greater context of society as those moments, movements became formative, which to say is if we were going to align the mid 60s, say 1968 to period roughly to around 1972, almost exactly 50 years ago, the political and sociological actions that were taking place, both in terms of the art world and in terms of society at large, are incredibly similar to the actions and the reactions that we're experiencing today. So you can take it from a standpoint of um, the notion of civil rights, um, women empowerment, gender equality, um, the barriers that have been put up to all sorts of people who were non-conforming, which is to say, weren't white guys that look like me, um, was incredibly high. And if you look at the Art Workers Coalition and the various other movements that were active, that were trying to move forward the conversation to find ways of becoming inclusive uh, within the art world and society at large, it's fascinating to reflect on the fact that those movements are very similar, if not identical, to the same movements that we're experiencing today. That um, this administration, our current government, is not radically different in terms of what it is doing to our society and the world at large as the end of the Johnson administration, the beginning of the Nixon administration were to the period of time 50 years ago. And what makes this conversation so acutely interesting to me, uh, both in terms of a personal standpoint and a political standpoint, is that those movements in the 1960s petered out 
And the movements we're seeing today are their direct descendants, and we do not want them to peter out. It's interesting looking at both uh, Karen and Electra's work over the last couple of days and having conversations with each of them about how the political environment is so important to their work how printmaking is an active way of making their work, distributing their work, infusing their work with its legacy of history. In the pieces that Karen just showed of the black power iconography um, mashed up with the Afro pick, for example, are the same symbols that were um, so important in Mexico 1968 Olympics, for example, and how those particular symbols are ways that we can transfer our energy to a way that well, people can think about the tactile forms of mediums that are time. So my question to Karen, I want you to talk a little bit more about using iconography that is part of both of our shared history in terms of our ages, but not in terms of our identity. And Electra, I want you to respond a little bit about your personal side, the ways of thinking about your iconography, how they're both similar to some of the things that we've seen in the past, but are incredibly unique to you as a person. Um, so, Karen, please. Um, it's really sad that we're back in the same place again, and my work could have been, it could have been a poster from the 60s. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> every time we do this, I have so many uh, different things I want to say. But the, the pick was huge for me growing up because we all had big afros. Um, we all had the pick stuck in the back of our head. Um, and uh, I just knew that it was an icon. Like, so when I'm making work, I really am thinking about the community that I grew up in. That's like the first thing that I'm thinking of is who, who, who's going to be interested in this work and, and that's who I'm thinking of. And I just knew that that image would be um, an image that, that my community would relate to. Definitely if you're in my age group. Um, and I guess it just, like you said, um, it's still kind of the same, unfortunately, it's still is important uh, to have a voice and to say these things and to hope that they make a difference this time around. Um, I'll just, I just want to jump in and say, Karen, though, that the, the pick also has the fist, you know, and it's a combination of the two, um, the symbol of the fist with the pick. And you have, you have really, you know, and, and maybe you could just unpack a little bit, like, what does the pick mean? I mean, you have this very personal hair comb with this very politically, you know, charged um, symbol of the fist. Wow. Uh, and so you have the personal and the political collide, like, you know, I wouldn't say colliding, but completely enmeshed in each other. And I think that says something so much about the life of black folk, you know, that the personal and the political is so enmeshed, you know, um, a cigar is not just a cigar, you know, um, that ordinary everyday objects um, are charged with this political um, message and this, this pol political, you know, in, in, in a political and social context that sort of denies one this very simple, you know, the very simple intimacies of everyday life, you know, the disruptions to that. It definitely wasn't an ordinary, an ordinary object because, yeah. I mean, a pick is made for black hair. So that says something in itself. But also, again, growing up, we would wear the pick in the back of our head with the, um, you know, fist coming up. And I mean, we were very aware of what that was. I wasn't just buying, um, you know, a comb. I was buying something that said black power. So they're entwined.
Lecture, do you want to talk about the iconography that comes into your work as well and how it's both universal and extremely personal? Uh, sure, uh, David, thank you. Um, I think my experiences, um, um, my biographical experiences inform uh, the beginning of my work in the sense that I was influenced by colonial art. So colonial art for us is um, in the mix of uh, indigenous art uh, with European and I grew up only being able to see art um, in books and the only art I could see live uh, was colonial art. So taking uh, those tropes uh, in a post-colonial society, uh, uh, another part that informed my imagery was um, Soviet avant-garde and was, um, you know, that mix of, uh, of um, Latin American uh, society, um, the, like leftist Latin American society, uh, just getting all these descriptions from uh, from a myriad of uh, Soviet publications. So that's the the images that uh, that inform my upbringing. Uh, in addition to that, um, I grew up in a hospital in a rural area of Colombia. So all the all the rituals of of, of healing. Um, um the the adults that I grew up with uh the cooks the nurses the uh the doctors the secretaries uh everybody that was um in the hospital was an influence for me um and and after that really the explosive desire to communi communicate uh, the ongo ongoing violence, um, massacres from, from the Colombian Civil War, the, the longest civil war in history, um, became, um, this, this world became an, an, an escape um, to, to talk about what was happening. Um, um, you know, in this particular work, um, you can see the one you are not alone. Uh, I think of, of systems of, of oppression and, and, and power as symbols that are universal. For example, the panopticon, for me, the panopticon talks about immigration, uh, surveillance and, and, the, and the systems of control that I grew up with that continue to today. Karen, in, in your work, the actual act of making a print mm -hmm. is a huge activity for you, and it, it really defines the work that you're producing. Right. Whereas a lecture, my impression from talking to you, the act of making a print was a means to an end as, as, as opposed to a fine art tradition. Uh, Karen, do you want to talk a little bit about the activity in the studio and thinking about linoleum cuts? Um, or thinking about other mediums that you you work with as both a meditative state and a means to craft your work. Mm -hmm. Now, Electra, maybe in response, I'd like you to talk a little bit about how printmaking both is part of your work, but really more means to an end. Um, so I definitely um, have an idea of what I want to make. Um, when we talked before, I, I told you that I have to kind of edit what I watch when I'm not creating work because so many different images kind of pop out. And um, when I'm making work, I collect these images, I decide what I want to say, and then I kind of pick out what technique I'm going to use, if it's going to be a um, paper litho, if it's going to be a linoleum cut, monoprint, what it's going to be. Um, and then I kind of attack it uh, compositionally. So I'll start maybe with one technique and then it's a lot of um, problem solving and technical issues and working different things out um, that create the piece. And often those things take the work um, to a different place. Um, 
often those things, um, they take the work to a different place that I don't even see at the time. So sometimes I have enough time in between a piece that I can look back and think, oh, I, I didn't even know that that was in the work. Or what's great is when other people see work and they have a complete different idea than what I saw um, in the work. Um, and it all came because of how I executed the piece. Does that answer your question? Electra? I just unmuted myself. Okay, um, so in terms of print making, uh, for, for time, I'll just talk about one work. Um, this is on um, the immigration checkpoint of the Cathara um, Autonomous Territory where I offered uh, passports uh, to people um, that would renounce to um, nationality, um, fascism and chauvinism and everything that assigns an involuntary human value to individuals. Um, one thing that where I incorporated printmaking and where I do is uh, making my environments more immersive this installation, I did in New York, but this particular one is uh, in Medellin, Colombia. Uh, the background is uh, of uh, pre-Columbian architecture uh, of the, that remained actually in the 1920s. Uh, it's, a, it's an indigenous bridge. And I, I wanted to sort of um, explore the technology of pre-Columbian architecture uh, and look at it from from the viewpoint of of uh, what will um, other um, pre-Columbian technologies would have looked like, and like that, imagine alternative worlds and universes. Um, this is my passport. Um, the when I took the the the, the plea to renounce to gender borders and, and nation borders in 2018 in in spring break in New York, um, it's um it's uh, a print I made um with um the <laughs> it's escaping uh, the machine is escaping my my mind. Uh, and uh, so it's, uh, it's an impression with gold foil. Uh, it's an artist multiple and I printed um, uh, a, a run that I, I gifted to people so everybody could uh, and, and could still apply to a free passport. So for me, printmaking is tied to performance uh, and it, it's uh, tied to site-specific installations, and it's tied to be reinterpreted uh, with fabric and layered with fabric. Thank you both for your responses. Um, I know that we're beginning to run into our buffer zone for beginning to take questions, and perhaps I should turn it back to Natasha, Yula, and Paula at this point. Um, thank you, David. Um, we do have a few questions. There are some kind of specific technical ones. Uh, one of the questions we have is about the process for making a paper litho, and uh, that question is addressed to you, Karen. Um, if you maybe want to say uh, a few words about your process. Yep. Um, and there was also a comment that your color bands from the abstract monoprints are still present in the newer work. Yes. Um, so, thanks for that, Laura, um, who I know and love. Um, so, paper litho is uh, you have to get an inkjet photocopy. And you take this photocopy and you cover it with gum arabic, gum arabic, and then you ink it up and that photocopy becomes your plate. And then that's what you run through the press. So many people think it's a transfer and it's not a transfer. That actual 
um, photocopy is the plate. Often you can get about two or three um, prints from it, but I usually do just one. Uh, and that's it. Great. Thank you. Uh, we, someone uh, also made a comment about um, Maintenant 14, a Dada magazine with contemporary activism in print, writing, painting. And the last issue was addressed to the political social situation today. And that was a comment uh, for David, um, um, just pointing out and asking <coughs> if you were familiar with that publication. I'm not, but it sounds like the sort of thing I would love. We have a reference for you. Uh, just excuse my, my dog. She must be hearing something that none of us hear. Um, and then we have another couple of great questions, actually. Um, this is for anyone. Are there certain prints or posters from the 60s civil rights movement that hold up particularly well today that you could think of um, or is being reissued today um, and that's that's for anyone on the panel um, maybe i can throw out the and babies poster which was done by the art workers coalition um, to call out the south of south the East Asian massacres that were going on during the Vietnam War. It originally intended to be a collaboration between the Art Workers Coalition and the Museum of Modern Art. Um, the museum quickly backed out of it, thinking that it would be too lethal for uh, their audience and for their patrons. And then the Art Workers Coalition then released it on their own. And it's this very powerful color image of children running naked after being um, uh, napalmed. Um, I think that holds up exceedingly well in terms of um, the direct comment about trying to move um, a conversation forward about recognizing the injustices in terms of the United States military and its invasion of uh, Southeast Asia. And, and I would say, I think that the fist as well, you know, um, the Black, Power, Black Panther fist holds up incredibly well across um, time and, you know, there's even a documentary about it on uh, Netflix. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's a, an, an iconic image and symbol that because, again, anyone else have a certain print or poster from the civil rights? Hmm. I can't think of the names of them. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got an interesting question too. Um, about whether there are images or iconography that are seared in my mind from the South African liberation movement and the anti-apartheid protests that I find here too. And um, I would say that actually, you know, the, the visual culture of protest is very similar in terms of text, image, and um, color. You know, there, there's a kind of economical use of image, text, and color to convey political content and I see I see that's very similar that there are you know posters there are buttons there are prints there are um, uh, all, all kinds of media print based media being um, deployed right now that is very reminiscent of, of that time you know um, and so uh, th there's not a particular image but obviously certain people's faces, the image, the portrait, the, the face of a person, you know, we've seen images of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd um, in, in, you know, during the anti-apartheid protests, there were lots of images of, um, you know, Nelson Mandela is obviously an, an iconic image, um, who was imprisoned and, and at the time, you know, wasn't the, the president of the country. So the, there is this, um, this resurgence of this visual culture, you know, printed matter has produced a lot of prints and has really engaged with that. Pierogi Gallery recently had a, uh, um, you know, print uh, prints and drawings that could be printed on T-shirts. Um, kind of fundraiser for an organization recently as well. So I, I kind of what is very similar to me is just this plethora, you know, this um, kind of growth again of the print culture 
in protest or print inspired as Electra's work is clearly inspired by the kind of graphic print culture and, and even in the recreating, even in using print mediums, uh, sorry. Um, sure, can I just say one thing to that is, um, that's one of the reasons I use linoleum cuts because the posters and the artwork that I was very familiar with back in the 60s, a lot of it was linoleum cuts and a lot of it was linoleum cuts because that was a really cheap, easy way um, to work. And, and this sort of brings us to another question that came up, which was, you know, how do you feel um, that social media impacts on protest art? Um, you know, what, in, in because print making, you know, when it, when 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 we were first able to print onto paper um, centuries ago, it was a revolution. You know, do you see that same connection with social media as being a kind of revolutionary moment where our images and our messages and our politics can be shared with this, you know, incredibly global audience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so much of my work became known uh, and my, the audience grew after the George Floyd murder. And it seems like because of the quarantine and everybody was on social media, um, people were really trading powerful images that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I I wanted to to uh, jump and say something uh, from from before, but I'll just uh, say something about that. Uh, there is also a, a disconnect because of massive uh, uh, surveillance. Um, so unfortunately, um, a lot of uh, the people that that are um, in the protest uh, in activist movements uh, don't even use social media or have social media accounts. Uh, so you know, for for safety reasons. So there is also uh, uh, um, it's like a two way street where uh, yes, social media is is useful to spread ideas across. Unfortunately, those ideas can get manipulated. And, and one of the things uh, we, we have seen is that um, historically uh, radical movements uh, become uh, commercialized or, or become um, co-opted co by an, uh, neoliberal agendas and, and they sort of, uh, they, they lose that, um, as, you know, as we call it in printmaking, that aura that uh, the first, the first iteration had that that's that's a, a, a great point and a great reminder and it leads us maybe into um our, maybe this could be our last question for the evening um, um and one of our attendees um asked you know what at all does art have in serving as a tool for pro for protest and maybe specifically pr uh, printmaking since this is the medium that we're really engaging in the show and with the artists um from uh, you know this uh, statement that artists have always been agents of cultural change they can sway opinions they can direct resistance or reform and that aesthetic culture has an ability to illustrate political truths um, and show the complicated structures of social culture. So uh, that, that so the question is around the role of art as a tool for protest. And I think it's a, uh, I would be curious to hear your take on this, on the, on the question, David, because I feel also like um, the culture in America today and especially, you know, the, the administration has sort of seen culture as an enemy almost of the state, you know, and has raised the uh, issue of, uh, you know, artists and cultural workers as being against, you know, the state and, and, and trying to ignite another kind of culture war. Um, so I'd be curious to hear, you know, when you look at the protest culture, uh, and the kind of artistic practices that support that. Um, what are your thoughts on, you know, 
um, as you were beginning the question, I was typing a response to someone who had written in, re in recent weeks, we've seen several large museums receive criticizing, criticism for canceling or mishandling shows and creating politically oriented work. How do you see institutions reacting to and exhibiting that type of work? And I think that both the response to your question and to this online question is that people need to come to terms with the fact, and I'm talking about people who run institutions that largely look like me, white, middle-class, middle-aged guys, that museums are privileged spaces. And by that, I mean they are designed to exclude artists, art, and visitors. And while this has been repeatedly pointed out, um, there needs to be a, a much broader sense that inclusion isn't just simply a temporary exhibition. That inclusion means acquiring, displaying, and promoting the works of all people in a manner that's even-handed and not just simply temporary. That when you go to see a museum and you go to see their so-called permanent collection, what you really should be seeing is something that is much broader than what we're seeing today. Mm. And it's not enough simply to sprinkle in artists of color. It's not enough to, sp to sprinkle in occasionally artists of different nationalities or genders. That the story that has been consistently been told isn't hermetic. It has to be a broader conversation. Just to say that we need to reimagine permanently what goes on display. And who controls those displays? And this isn't a new conversation. This is the exact same conversation that goes back to the 1960s and 70s. It's how to not necessarily just simply push people like me away, but rather than to draw in other conversations such that there could be a broader consistency of what's being brought into the institutions, not just in terms of the artists and the artwork, but also the audiences. And particularly at a moment in time that we're experiencing now, institutions shouldn't be simply replaying past history. They need to be an active participant in the history that we're experiencing now in order to change society and protect it going into the future. Um, I couldn't agree more. And um, I think that, you know, uh, this, we, we, I'm, I'm just going to mention this question, uh, and we, we, I don't think we have time to answer it, but I think it brings us back to, um, you know, the emotional texture of what we are all experiencing and have been experiencing in our different positions and, and neighborhoods and communities is, um, you know, that, uh, and this question was specifically directed at you, Karen, um, that these are very political pieces and are they emotional to create, that they are also beautiful, but they don't necessarily evoke the power and the pain of the subject matter. And there's that subtle play, I think, in your work between all those things. And it's sort of, that question sort of brings us full circle again to the show and the premises of the show. Um, and uh, you, would you like to say a few words about that uh, before I, uh, maybe conclude our conversation. I think it's a nice note to end on. Um. So was part of that, did you ask if the work was emotional to make? Mm -hmm. Very. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I just made a lot of work for two shows and they're very political. Um, and I had to kind of take a break and make beautiful flowers for a while, something that kind of brings me joy because I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm outraged when I think about the, um, the images that I want to make. And then I'm kind of trapped in that while I'm figuring out the image. Um, but then by the same token, I was also saying to somebody recently that I should start, I wanted to start painting like balloons and pretty floral things and um, I don't think I, I would stick with that very long because this is the work um, that really moves me in that, you know, I have something to say and this is the best way for me to say it. Mm -hmm. But it really is very emotional to make, um, but it, I feel like I'm doing the right thing because I want to keep a conversation going. I think it's important.
Absolutely. And I think the emotional is part of the work and the labor that we do, you know, um, as artists, as curators, as writers, as critics, as people in, involved in the arts. It's that, you know, there's the intellectual work, there's the practical work and pragmatic work, but there's also the emotional and the labor, the real work that goes into creating uh, art and exhibitions that speak to people and speak to our times and um, tries to reimagine and uh, point, you know, point the way towards um, a more humane and equal world. So thank you everyone for your attention. Um, thank you so much to the artists and our special guest um, this evening, David Plasker, for being here, um, to IPCNY for hosting us, and um, to all of you for joining us. And we hope you'll you. stick around for um, uh, love and hope and care. Yes, thank you, Natasha and Yulia and Paula for putting Living in America together for IPCNY this fall. And thank you to Karen and Electra for sharing your work with us tonight. It's been really great to hear how you think about your work in this context of how art can stir or inspire cultural and um, social political change. Um, and David, thank you for being here to really situate, situate us in a historical grounding of the moment we're in um, and the way that imagery and symbols and iconography really can transcend time in a generative way and the way those symbols also evolve as we need them to. Um, and I think what's super important for folks who may be on the younger side to realize is that our current time is so similar to times that have happened before. And yet what I think Living in America is interested in is how this moment today, this movement today also has um, a lot of energy and hope for the future and is not going away. So I think that's a wrap for tonight. Thank you everybody for being here. Thank um, you. And um, yeah. Jen, sorry to interrupt you, but is it possible for us to see everyone so we could all wave goodbye and see oh, who we've been uh, we're actually in a webinar, so everyone's sort of, if we're in the Living in America play, they're sort of behind the fourth wall. So I think we have to just wave to each other <laughs> tonight. Um, but so thank you everybody for being here. Um, we'll let you go watch the debate. Visit ipcny.org slash living in America to visit the online exhibition. Book your visit to come see us in Chelsea um, beginning tomorrow. Follow us at ipcny on Instagram at Assembly Room NYC at Instagram. Follow the survey link at the end of the webinar to send us some good feedback and have a wonderful night. Thanks everybody. Good night. Good night. Grazie. Buonanotte.